So the way I'm going to run this is um, as I'm going to go through some of the work that we've done um, in resilience research. And one of the um, aspects that I'm thinking will be helpful is to do something practical and give you all an opportunity to, um, uh, I guess, to do something in terms of a practical application for yourselves. Um, so I have a video of a session there where I've used the resilience research in practice. And um, what I've got, I've got for you is it in the chat box. So if everyone can open the chat box on the side, I've given you a link to the Dropbox of uh, a PDF form that if you want to just down click on that and download that. Um, and then you can use that when I'm talking as well, which will help you to understand how to use the, the model. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, if anyone is having difficulty with seeing it, please take a bit of, usually I have somebody driving this with me um, so they can tell me if I'm not loud enough or there's been a problem with the audio. So please, um, if you're having difficulties, just tell me. <laughs> I'll turn your um, mute button off and then, turn, then talk to me. So uh, we have... So the, the Resilience Donut is, um, is a model that I have written and, um, and I, as a director of the Resilience Centre, everyone in the practice in the Resilience Centre will actually <coughs> use the model. <coughs> so again, we're just um, using some data language which we have in Sydney um, from the original inhabitants of this land is um, the words are Warami Nalua Midika which says, let's just share stories. So here's a photo of half of our team. Um, we couldn't get us all at the happening at the one time in our photo. Um, so we've got about 14, 15 psychologists and social worker who are working in the practice. We are all using a solution focused approach. I think three of the team are on these sessions right now. So three of us are actually talking about different aspects of our practice and how we use that in therapy. <clears throat> and um, it's just a great place to work, a really good place to work. During COVID, we are absolutely overwhelmed with um, cases at the moment. Um, so we're, we're challenged with that. Um, what I'd like to notice is that, uh, just to, to actually clarify, resilience is used as a bit of a buzzword and which irritates me no end because resilience research has been going for a long time, for at least 25 years. And um, one of the aspects of resilience research is it's quite different to positive psychology. It didn't start in a solution-focused um, uh, um, philosophy, it really just started in an ecological approach. So resilience research points us continually to an ecological approach. And an ecological approach, when I go like this, establishes that there is the child in the middle, then there's the family, then there's the families nested in a community and the communities nested in a larger group and, and so on. And so when we're looking at an ecological approach, you can see how resilience affects from all levels. Um, and also resilience is not a noun, it's not a descriptive word. <clears throat> when you talk about someone who has resilience, it's not a, it doesn't make sense because resilience is actually a process. It's like a verb, it's a doing word and it's a process that happens as an interaction. So it's an interactional process. Um, and when we start thinking about resilience as an interactional process and an ecological model, we need to then look at, well, what are the pathways of interactions that build um, resilience? And how can we have conversations that actually help us to build resilience? So I, I think about resilience as conversational um, the process of, of resilience is through a conversation. I see resilience as an interaction with people and, and resources around somebody. And I see that, that resilience is not something that we will have at any one time, but rather that we will be able to keep building resilience in our process. So like a doing word. So just to define resilience, to be so that we're all on the same page, um, 
<clears throat> the International Resilience Project says it's the human capacity to face and even be strengthened by adversity. So it's not like the happiness or the positive psychology work that's been done, which is very much about what are happy people like. Resilience is about looking at um, how do the people who have got it, who've been through adversity, how do those people who have survived and thrived, how do they cope differently? What is in common with them? So it's a very different pool of research um, in terms of people, but also um, it's looking at, well, what is the human capacity to be strengthened? What is the, is it about adversity that makes a difference? We've looked at Unger's research He's um, in Can Canada. His research is just wonderful. He says it's the capacity and an individual, and an individual or a group, to navigate with one's ecology, and the capacity for their social for their social ecology to navigate for them. So he's now bringing in. It's like not necessarily the person's ability to relate to this uh, to activate the ecology, but it's both the capacity of the social ecology to navigate for them. So here's this interactional process. So when you come to my definition, I break the definition up into three parts and I see these three parts as measurable. And it's the individual or group's process of continual development. And that's of personal competence or group competence. And it's while negotiating with resources and in the face of adversity. So the three aspects of resilience that we should always be talking about is the continual development of competence through navigating and negotiating with the people and the resources around you at the same time as adversity. They tried to take adversity out of the resilience research and then they brought it back because that establishes what happens with people's um, how they manage to navigate and negotiate and their practice of that. So um, when, we, when we look at um, how to look at that in terms of a solution focused approach, um, I am going to, to try and show you how the resilience research is coming from this angle and the solution focused is over here and how actually they collide. And when you see really good research, this is what happens. Um, so the four components of a solution-focused approach that I will draw on um, is that it's future-focused. It's looking for where we're, where we're going, what's the preferred future. And I I'm, I'm, don't need to tell you all about this because I'm sure all of you understand this, but we'll just rate these according to these four things. Secondly, it explores what the person has already been able to achieve, aspects of their preferred future. Thirdly, it helps you to rate on a scale where they are on the journey towards their preferred future. And it gives you the ability to have reflection of what's working through compliments and perhaps assigning an experiment that helps people to test how to move into that direction. So when we start looking at those four aspects of that, um, we then can look at the difference between a solution focused and a strength approach. So again, we've got another theoretical or technique with a strength approach, it looks at focusing on strengths and abilities rather than problems and difficulties. It has positive attitudes around people's capacities and dignities. It has a stance. The strength approach has a stance or a position rather than a technique. So your stance is you are watching and, and admiring and, and respecting and having a positive attitude towards someone's position. Um, it also, this, the approach then facilitates a process of identifying a person's own strengths rather than showing what's, what's strong and what's working towards it. So you're not in a position to say you have to do this, but rather a curious position of how did you do this and what's happening that's working. And usually when you see a strengths approach, they're usually looking at personal characteristics or a skills based which is very different to the donut or the resilience donut, which we're going to talk about. So the resilience donut I see as a strengths perspective and a solution focused approach. It uses both at the same time. So the strengths perspective <clears throat> that the donut uses is that it's not looking at what is working. It actually is rather looking at who and where it is working in someone's life. So we're not focusing on what you have got going for you, but rather who have you got going for you? 
and where is that going well? So we're starting to look at contexts and relationships. <clears throat> and when you're using a strength perspective in the donut, you're curiously observing who and where are on that person's team. And you're noticing how the relationship or the connections with those who and where actually builds the strengths within them. In the solution-focused approach, the, the resilience donut draws on the solution-focused approach in the conversation that you have around the donut. So the conversations may be looking at the preferred future, um, must be asking who and where and and, and the things that have already occurred in various aspects of the donut. It's con start scaling the context, so which, which area of your donut is stronger than others and getting them to start prioritizing what's stronger than the others. So it's actually forcing the person to scale what's working better than what's than in all of their positive aspects. And it's assigning a, an experiment at the end to try and link the three strong top strengths. <clears throat> so here's the picture of the donut. As you can see, the center of the donut says, I have, I am, and I can. It says, I have people to help me cope. I am a nice person and I can do things to change my circumstances. And we have that. Um, those three, three phrases from the research on resilience and the research on resilience that established what it is that people who managed to survive and thrive through adversity, what they said about themselves. Now, there are two models. We're looking at the adult model today. We have a child model which looks at the development of, of personal competence and resilience. Um, with the adult model, we do a lot of reflecting on what people have said and has from their past has actually helped them. And on the outside of the donut, in the fleshy part of the donut or the cake side of the donut, you have seven factors. And these are the seven factors that have been shown from our research to that identify different areas of influence in a person's life. And each of these factors have what we call tensions. So it's a bit like a muscle that's exercised, you have tension with a muscle that's exercised because it has resistance and, and, and builds that muscle. When there isn't any tension and there isn't any, um, then there isn't, that doesn't become a very strong factor. So we're actually looking at a level of conflict, but a level of um, strengthening, which goes through some of the conflicts that occur in each of these factors that cause someone to build their resilience. Um, basically, what we're trying to find is way is the the, um, the top strengths. So when we when we have a conversation with someone, we're doing a scan of their top strengths. We're trying to find where and who um, these these factors are working for them, how they manage to get the I have, I am, and I can. We're trying to find what, where, and who are already working. And what we try and do then is to find the top three. And we do what we call a linking three strengths or a, what we call a donut moment. A donut moment is where we connect three strengths in one, at one point in time. And we might do that through a conversation. And you'll hear me doing that on the, um, the video that I'm going to show you. So the process of looking for these strengths uses the four processes of optimistic thinking, um, prioritizing what's working, how to change perspective um, and activate the helpful resources. And what we try and do when we're having optimistic thinking is basically we're only looking at what works. So each of the factors of the donut gather what's working in those areas. So you might score two out of 10. That means you've got two things working out of 10 in that factor. Um, and it's so it's not saying that that's not scoring well. It just means it's that there might be another factor that might be scoring four out of 10, in which case that's working a little bit more. But it's not saying that one's poor and one's, one's good. It's just basically saying they're all measuring something that's strong. We're just trying to find out which is the strongest. So that optimistic thinking then starts, say, gives us that ability to start using terms like, you know, how did you manage to get that to work? Um, what, are you, what are you noticing is changing? So that sense that 
um, there's change and, um, and agency in each of the factors. Getting people to prioritise gets people to actually start sorting what's working and what, um, what's working better than the other. And that in repetitive sorting is a really good way of people learning how to um, reinforce the things that are going well for them. The other aspect which I find really lovely in having the conversation around the donut um, is actually helping people to sh change their perspective. So you may be asking someone, you know, so what is it about that person that's working? What is it about that person that they like about you? Or what is it they would say about you? Or if I was able to be sitting on the sideline and, and, um, and I'd ask them, your best friend, what they thought about you, what would they say? And it's, it sometimes catches people off guard, but it does give them that ability to see outside of themselves, which I think is a very lovely um, strength-based approach. <clears throat> so when we start thinking about activating helpful resources, in all of the solution-focused work, we, we use resources as being one of the things that we use. Well, in using the donut, quite often when you're working with someone with a mental health crisis or so on, activating the helpful resources becomes our means of being able to um, help people to lean in and helping people to lean in and help uh, and connect may be helpful or not helpful depending on the person involved. But if you've been able to work with the person themselves to help them to activate the most helpful resources, you then have a sense of agency around the helpfulness. And so um, what we're trying to do is to, to encourage conversations that help activate the resources um, themselves. So ways of questions that we use in a solution focused approach Here's a list of questions that we might use. Um, you might say, what's worked in the past? What did you have? Uh, what do you have that will help towards the preferred future? Um, what if something happened, who would notice? Uh, um, who's on your team? Um, who helps? Uh, it might be, you know, who did you learn this from? Um, it might be, who are you when you were feeling safe? You know, what, what is it that you're doing when you're feeling safe? Um, who did you learn it from? Um, and then, or else we could just use the resilience donut. <laughs> and the resilience donut almost like gives you a, for me, I always think I've got a donut shaped brain. My brain is in it's sort of like circular and I have these factors that go around and I think, okay, I must ask about this next, next bit and see if they, if what what strengths they've got there so essentially what i'm trying to do is to bring in like resilient conversations and when i think about a resilient conversation it's not about oh what is it that you're doing you know what is it that's good about you and let's list all of that which is very positive psychology the resilient conversations that i see nested in a solution focused approach is actually asking about the everyday ordinary things that are happening um, in someone's life and finding out what's their strongest and most helpful resources, you know, asking what's working, who's on their team, where they've learnt their values. And by that, um, what I'm doing here is that I'm establishing a, um, a, again, a nest for someone so that they're then able to see the supports that they've got, both their old supports and their new supports and also giving them the agency to draw on others for perspective and seeing who they can draw on. In some ways, the conversation, the resilient conversation is activating the world, their, their world around them. Um, so some of the conversations that we want to do um, here, I'm going to give you the opportunity to um, to uh, to, to do this, so to give you an, act, um, an actually a, uh, an ability to, to, to scale this. So um, I have a video that's coming up. And what I've got, um, for those of you who've just come on board, if you just hop into the chat, just look in the chat box, you'll da you can download a PDF file that has a form. Hi, Lynn, um, that link is not in the chat. Okay, I'll just try again. Thank you for your share.
Okay, let me have a little look. See if I can do chat again. Okay, I'll try again. Just check it's going to everyone. There we go. Yep, thanks. Okay, so just everyone get that now. Um, just tell me, can you give me a thumbs up if you've managed to download it? Perfect. So, and I'm hoping that we are so clever at being able to get, uh, this is going to do a little trick again. I will stop share for a second. And try and do this beside you. Did anyone face any issue? It says that the file does not exist. It doesn't, it doesn't say it exists? Yeah, I'm not so sure, but I'm seeing that. Anyone else got that problem? I'm getting the same message. Are you? Okay. Well, we might just have to um, get you to do something different then. I can possibly get myself to get out of the big box. Would you be able to drop the file into the chat group here? In the physical file instead of a Dropbox link? Yeah, I could if I could possibly get out of my, um, my slides. For some reason, I haven't even been able to get out into my slides. Mm. Right. Okay, finally did it. Okay, back again. So um, if I put it up there, I'm not sure I can. Um, so what I'll get you to do is something that we do when we run out of our files. <laughs> I want you to draw two circles on a piece of paper, two circles and a circle on the inside. It's like a bigger circle and an inner circle inside. That's right, like a donut. Okay. And then divide the circle up into seven factors, the, out, the donut part up into seven factors. And I'll give you, I'll share my slide again. There we go. Um, and in sharing my slide again, so you, if you can, everyone can see the, the donut there. So I'd like you to just label it, partner, skill, family, education, parent, friends, community, and work. And Essentially, the partner factor is about having a partner that's connected but not necessarily controlling or overwhelming or managing everything for them. It's more like that lovely 50-50 mix of warmth but at the same time is a challenging person who actually helps you to grow. The skill is having something that you do that you go, yes, I can do that and you feel a sense of achievement in that. The family factor is parents, siblings, your own children, aunties, uncles, grandparents. The education factor is a sense of being able to learn and being associated with an education institution. Um, friends factor may be that sense of people who like you but will sort of be on your team but you can actually share a fair bit with them and they'll be honest. Community factor is part of a wider community like a church group or a, a local community where there's a sense of a common belief. Um, the work factor is feeling a sense of belonging. It doesn't necessarily mean paid work, it may be voluntary work, but a sense of belonging and usefulness in a workplace. 
So now that's very, very brief and I could probably speak for an hour's just giving you the actual rundown of each of those. But I'd like you to think through using your selective or elective listening. I'd like, as I have a conversation with the actress on the screen, and I'm not going to give you the full screen on this because somehow it keeps freezing. Um, I'd like you to use your elective listening and elect to listen for aspects of the donut. And as you do that, try and give a little bit of a, you know, a score or a, an estimate as to how much you think. Zero is that they don't have this factor working for them at all. And 10 is this looks like this one's a strong one for them. And give them a score somewhere in between that. And you just got to guess. You know, there's nothing at this point that is, you know, definite. Um, but I'd like you to think about what strengths might be stronger. What are the strengths that you're going to actually be curious more about? Where is your, where is your curiosity going to lead into what conversations around which factor? And then, um, and then we'll have a time where we can start thinking about what sort of questions you would want to be curious about and how you might link them together. So let's try and see if we can get this a bit better as well. And I will try again. Here we go. Tell me a little bit about what brought you here. What made you decide that you wanted things to be different? Um, Can you hear? There's, there's quite a bit of stuff. Um, I guess basically at the moment the work's a bit intense. Um, where do you work? Um, I would do reception work just for like a building company. Uh -huh. Been there for a few years now, but just kind of feeling really, I don't know, like I just basically don't want to go to work anymore. Like it's just making me feel a bit anxious. Um, and then like I did have a breakup with an ex-boyfriend and that hasn't really gone to plan. So I moved back in with mum because of that. And then just things with mum at the moment aren't great either. So it's just all at once. Okay. Does she know you're here? No. Very brave. Hmm. So have you got any... Um friends or something that you like to hang out with? Yeah. Um, I don't know if like they're the best company, but I've got some work friends that I hang out with on the weekend. Um, one of my best friends, Listy, but I don't really see her much anymore. What's her name? Listy. Listy. Mm -hmm. Where do you know her from? From school. Mm. That's nice. yeah, I've been friends for ages. And you haven't seen her for a while? No. So if she noticed that this was, like, things had gone really well here and things had turned around for you, what would she notice about you if she hasn't seen you for a while? She'd probably hear from me. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably be texting back and forth, like, you know, a little bit more. <laughs> What would she say to me if I happened to talk to her about you? Not that I'm going to, what would she tell yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's actually really hard to think about. Because, um, I mean, I've only known you for like 15 minutes or something now. So what would Listy tell me that, that I might need to know about you? Um, she'd probably mention Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, she'd tell you that yes I definitely love graphic design um maybe say that I'm a bit wild on the weekends maybe I don't know okay did you say any nice things about it probably just say that we've been friends for ages hmm. so it sounds like you're good at keeping friends I don't know, I've just got the one, maybe, so. 
Okay, and that's not even that good, so I probably wouldn't say that. Okay. So it sounds like, too, you wanted to study, like a graphic design. You started studying, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I started... I started studying, I kind of really only got through the first semester okay. um, and then I kind of went back to part time and because I had to work quite a bit and then I ended up just dropping it all together to work full time. Yeah. So would you go back to the same course? Yeah, I guess I, I haven't really thought too much about it but I probably could just go back and if it's not too much time passed, so like I could probably go back and mm -hmm. like just start where I finished off, maybe. Okay. So it sounds like you liked the course. Yeah, I really did like it. I just, yeah, stuff happened and I just ended up having to stop. So, mm. and it's interesting. <clears throat> You work as a receptionist in a building company and it sounds like you actually like graphic design. Do they know that? Has anyone asked you to do anything for their website or...? Um, I mentioned it once to my boss, but he didn't really care, so... It's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't really feel like the space to kind of yeah. ask, so it's a bit awkward. Mm. Um, do you have, like, like a club or a community that you're sort of part of or a neighbourhood or friends? of friends, okay, just, just curious, like in, in the family where you've grown up, were you in a neighbourhood and you had friends of, in the neighbourhood, like parents of friends and stuff like that? Oh, um, I guess when we were growing up as kids, we probably had some, like our street, you could play with the kids on the street, which is kind of fun, but we've kind of moved on from there. So you don't connect with no. those things. Okay. So... Just trying to think about here. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing and give you an opportunity to feed in for me for those people who are able to. Um, you can just unmute your mic as you go. Um, what were you? What were some of the strengths that you saw that you that you, you could hear that you may build on from that conversation? I could see three. Mm -hmm. um, what were the three? It, even though she doesn't, you know, she's not real happy with her work. She is working. Um, she is providing for herself. You know, she's actually made that decision to leave education because things happened and went working full time. So she's showing that she's providing for herself and, and able to stick it, even though she doesn't like it so far. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I didn't give it a high number because she's not happy there, but I just did think that was one. Mm -hmm. And then friends, um, you know, she does have this friend that she knows. I think if she was in a really bad spot, she could ring and call on. Um, so she, like you were saying, good ability to make friends, but she's saying no. But then again, she's had this friend for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other one is education. Um, even though she stopped it, she loved it. Um, she obviously was able to do it just other than life things happened. So there mm. were the three that I picked up there. Mm. Mm. That's, yeah, that's great. Did anyone notice me trying to have a little suggestion of how to connect those three strengths in the conversation? Did anyone notice what I'd said? To connect the three? Well, you were asking her whether she has um, um, mentioned that she is studying mm. at her work and she, it wasn't, wasn't noticed, but she only mentioned it once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, that's where I would say in the, in the conversation of using the, um, the donut, 
it's like you, you, your brain's focusing on where you think there is some potential for, for uh, where, it, where it's already working, where there's a little bit of a less resistance to, um, to things. So, that, so what I was asking there was like, has, have they actually asked you, with graphic designers, have they actually asked you to help out on the website? Like, that'd be cool. Now, I'm not telling you to go and do that, but I'm doing a link where she may not have seen the value in the workplace. Now, it might mean that she doesn't do anything with it, but it might mean that she thinks, oh, I might offer that or who knows. But it's that conversation process that we're trying to do and just being able to bring up well, what's working and how to link those three. Um, does anyone want to make a comment on the process of doing that lap of the donut um, in the conversation? Was it awkward? Was it normal? Was it something you would normally do anyway? Was it different? I, I do strengths um, work with my clients and I use similar type things, but I've never looked at it from this angle. Um, of linking it together and and um, uh, not not doing it like as an intake thing, working out what's going on. Um, I would do it down the track, you know, helping people find their strengths and um, where they're at um, mm -hmm. with things. So a little bit different. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. It's interesting, um, I think I would, this is a first session, so I would be, this is how I would gather my, um, the history or the background, um, because I'm wanting to know who's there, you know, I, I have a very busy practice and I'm, I'm often scared that someone's coming in and I don't know what the supports that they've got around them. And so I'm really wanting to know who's there to support them, but I also want to know what do other people think of them. Um, but to be honest, you know, you, you, you can't actually ask what people think of them, but you can ask the, the, the child, um, or the child or the, the, the client. I'm just looking at, um, someone's written, her mum is supportive, letting her move back home. Yes. And I actually think that's, that's really valid to actually acknowledge that that's, that's scoring some, somewhere. She knew she could go back there. Uh, could you please put the donut up? I came right on time, but it seems you were on for a while. Okay, I'll put that up in a second. Um, I'll just put the donut. We'll share the screen again. Anyone else got any comments that you see that you may be able to use this in your own solution practice? Solution focus practice. And that it may perhaps change how you're questioning. Hi Lynn, it's Steph. Hi Steph. You know I use this model but I haven't seen the LAP method before. I'm often aiming for the, the trifecta or the three <laughs> factors together which I really enjoy using because it can be a bit of work but when the lights go on they really go on and it makes a big difference to the person's perspective. But your description of using it as a LAP and just to do a survey of what's in people's lives I think is a really helpful um, quick assessment to make of where someone's coming in from and understanding where the supports are and, and perhaps finding out there may not be many and being a bit more alert as a practitioner. Mm, thank you. That's nice feedback. I, um, I don't know if you've noticed in the video um, that whenever there was something that I found that I was more curious about, I deliberately leant forward and wrote it down and slowed that process so, you know, so tell me about your friends. Oh, what was her name again? And writing it down and tell me a little bit more about them. So that I actually had a, a physical um, connection with the areas that I felt that I was, look, I had that sort of elective listening to or that the positive strengths-based approach. So I was basically trying to find where I was drawn to in, in looking for strengths almost like, oh, this looks like I might dig out some more good stuff. Um, so that's my, that's my physical way of doing things. And I do that a lot with children. When I'm working with children, I'll say, oh, can we draw that one? You know, let's, let's look in and draw in that so we can linger longer on this area that looks like it's quite strong. 
when you're having a conversation to find resources, the longer you linger on the area of strengths, the more that you dig up that's helpful, um, that you may find that's about to go into the next part of the conversation. And as you can see in my next part of the conversation, I then start with the miracle question. Um, and in asking the miracle question, I then I go into the miracle question with some ammunition. <laughs> I've got some ammunition of strengths that I can see that I can float into that miracle question so it fleshes out a bit more. So by having this conversation to find the resources, I feel like I'm nested in their ecology. <laughs> Remember, we're talking about resilience as an ecological model. I'm nested in their ecology and now I'm better positioned um, I'm, I'm armed to actually ask the miracle question with a little bit more, um, more curiosity, but also with using their right terminology or their right language, or just say your mum noticed, or what would your, what would your best friend Listy notice, or, um, you know, let's just imagine the miracle happened and, you know, what would be different about perhaps your work or, you know, it's that sort of, um, almost like I've got a bit of credibility because I've already had that conversation around that. So some of the ideas of linking the strengths together, you know, in conversation, it's not our right to go in and say, you've got to go and do this. Um, but just even say, have you thought of or have there been times when you've noticed when those, you know, when your work and your graphic design skills could come into place. Again, that's just a curious, gentle way of letting them know that that's a possibility to link them together. And the reason we do that is because in our actual research for, and remember the research with resilience is based on, if you think about the bell curve, the bell curve is of people who are struggling, have gone through some pretty awful adversity, and they've looked at the group at the top here who do well despite the adversity. And then they've looked at what it is those people have in common. And one of the things that they have in common is a, a number of strengths and the strengths that are connected in some way. And so we sort of talk about that as being, um, like I always talk about it as being like a three-legged stool. You know, you find your three legs or your three aspects of strength. And that's sort of what people are, are pivoting on and that hold them behind the scenes. So, when we're, when we're doing that, we're trying to find out what are the three strengths that are holding someone. And generally, when someone comes to see us, one of those strengths might have been knocked out or they've forgotten about them or, or they've, said they've lost someone that has passed away or they've lost a job. And so there has been a significant strength that's tipped them. And so finding those three strengths and fitting a, finding a way of finding another three strengths is part of our conversational tool in the donut. So with when we're collecting the con connecting the concepts of solution focused and strength approach and the resilience work, what we're doing is that we're trying to sort out what's strong in each factor. We're not trying to work out what's not going well. We're not asking about what's not going well. You know, notice that she talked about Mitch, this, this boyfriend that there'd been a breakup. We've just got that information. We're not saying that, it, that it's bad or good. We're just saying that that's the information. It, it tells you that's probably as she's scoring low on the factor, but it's not a zero. So she's had a partner and she knows how to have a relationship. So there's some good or some bad things in there, but we don't need to focus on that. We're just looking at where the strengths are and we're trying to work out what's, what's stronger than the other. Um, I always think about too, that the more you sort positive things, the more you evoke positive memories. So you're saying, well, why is that stronger than the other one? Well, that's stronger because I've spent more time with that person or, or no, I had a really good friendship with her, but I haven't seen her for a while. So therefore, you know, there's another strength that's higher than that. But, you know, I could come back in here and that was a good relationship. So it evokes memories. You also do the what if, you know, what if we link three strong strengths? What if we do something with one of them to make them even stronger? Um, what will be different if we notice, um, you know, what, what strengths will we notice in others and ourselves if we do something with each of those? What would change if we do something with each of the strong factors? Now, the, 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 the principle behind the resilience donut is that you don't focus on the lower numbers. You only focus on the top three and you do something with those top three in order to move forward. 
Um, so what we're doing is we're not looking for personal characteristics here. We're not looking like the Gallup strengths or the, the VIA strengths. We're looking at resources and other people's views of them. We're trying to connect the strengths to help others to lean in or to evoke a response in the person that we're working with to help them to activate their strengths so that they can help other people lean in. Um, and sometimes just even the process of finding the strengths activates a change in thinking. As with any solution focused work, you just have an activation it's of, of change in thinking and oftentimes they go and do something different. And that's been my experience of not actually solving it at all, but rather going, oh, gee, it'd be interesting to find a way to connect those. I have no idea what have you thought of. Oh, it'd be interesting to see what you might do with your strengths this week. Um, I'd love to know what, you're, what, what you come up with. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, working out um, the behaviour and giving a, pur purposeful an act, a purposeful activity will generate some change in thinking. So um, I, will, I will often in therapy say, well, look, you know, we can talk to the doctor about giving you some medication, but how about we try doing donuts, a donut a day instead of some medication each day for this next week or so to see if it makes a difference. So let's think of some donut activities that we could do and the donut moments are when we've linked those three strengths together and they could be really ordinary everyday stuff like you know let's say you're going to the gym this week and you make a phone call on the way to the gym to talk to your mum and when you're at the gym you have a, um, a chat with a friend that you've made there so that's your family your skill and your friend factor that's simple but you intentionally are activating that. So once they're starting to get into that habit of going, okay, where are my strengths and how am I going to activate that? They then um, uh, are starting to think, okay, how do I lean people in? How do I help people to lean in a little bit more to me when I need some help? Um, in our research, just to give you, for those nerds like me out there um, who like to look at how to test theory, um, the three strengths, um, there is a, a beautiful research with Donnan and Hammond in 2007 where they had a list of like something like about 36 strengths that they had seen with people in their research and really good research on resilience. Um, what they found is that um, that this is a, a, a looking at, these are the number of strengths down the bottom and they clustered them into groups. And up here is the level of being picked on or bullied. Uh, and they found that those people who had, so this is one cluster of one, two, three, between three and four clusters of strengths, there was a significant change. And so that line tells you that there's a cut point that says that something happens at about three, that enables um, the most significant change in being bullied. And after that, of course, it gets better. Again, we have the same one here with um, children who are being um, bullies in the playground. Um, the more strengths that they have, the less likely that they are to bully. And this study here was looking at um, uh, children who are being um, uh, I think this is another one, a very similar one in terms of bullying, um, and that the more that strengths they had, the less that they had. So we replicated a similar study and we looked at, and this is in our adult work um, as well, and we've had similar findings in our children's work. Um, so this is our, our study that's about to be um, published, hopefully in the next journal, um, that you see where... Um, the more strengths we see are cut pointed around this point here. So this is um, one, two, three, no, zero strengths, and this is above the mean. So people scoring below five, for example, on their scores, that was zero strengths above the mean. So anything above five was scoring um, that was above the mean. So it's people who had one strength above the mean, um, they were scoring fairly high in terms of depression, anxiety. So zero strengths above the mean, it was still high. It just wasn't as high as one for some reason. But once they had 
um, two or three strengths above the mean, there seemed to be quite a change at this point. So we call that a cut point. It's not huge, but it was quite significant between three strengths and one and zero strengths. So what we're seeing is that the more strengths, of course, the better a person's outcome and the less likely that they have depression, anxiety and stress. So we use that in terms of our, I guess, validating that idea that we work on the strengths. The more strengths that we have, the more activation that we have in terms of our resources, the more likelihood that we're going to have some um, development of our competencies. So we will be seeing that study come forward um, and so on. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and give people opportunity to ask me questions. Um, since I bombarded you with stuff and you've had a little chance to practice it, I'd love to hear your questions or any comments. So just remember, unmute your button and just um, uh, ask me questions and I'll leave the chat box open as well. Am I able to get a copy of your slides? Um, I'll try very hard. Um, so Judith, if you can send me your email address, then I will get that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Judith. I have a question. Um, me yep. again, sorry. <laughs> um, do you normally um, uh, score the strengths when the client's talking, or do you at times get the client to look at it and score it? I uh, do both. Right. Um, I do both. And I think one of the things that's really lovely is that um, it's just to, the, to work with together, almost like you, you, you both of your heads are down looking at the donut, working out how that might be able to be, uh, you know, manipulate the three strengths together. So sometimes, particularly with children, you could have it so that the children themselves do their own donut strengths um, and they work out where their strengths are. Um, that's been really helpful. Um, and um, uh, I'm just wondering how I can save all of these rather than write them all down. I might try and save. Everyone's wanting cup copies of the slides. What if, rather than me sending out one to everybody? Lynn, you can just save the chat. <clears throat> that might do it. Do you know how to do that? No. If you go to the chat box, look at the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see three little dots. Yep. Just click on the dots and it will say save chat. All right, I'll do that at the end when people are chatting. So that's a text on your computer. Thanks, John. No worries. Helpful. Yeah, so um, just to finish that conversation, one of the things I think could be really help, is, I find really helpful is to be able to, um, to get, to, to put it into the hands of the, the children or the adults that I'm working with and let them have an estimate. Um, we do have, like with the Resilience Donut, we've developed a resilience report, which, you know, people can hop online and do the resilience report themselves. And I can give you a link to that. Um, here, I'll just see if I can do it to everyone. Um, so, so that's a link to the um, to the website, the resilience report, um, and there's also our own website for the resilience donut, which will give you more information. without the gaps, of course. So um, with the resilience report, one of the things that's really lovely about that is that it does give you several levels, several measures, measures of competence. Remember the definition is competence, building competence, um, navigating with resources, and at the same time going through adversity. So it actually gives you a measure for all three of those um, because that's what is the definition. So when we try and um, look at the interaction of that, we what we do see is that the higher the level of resources, 
the higher the level of competence that's developed and the lower the level of the difficulties that are associated with um, an, with a, an adversity. So that's been a really lovely level of, of measures that we've used and we use that with all of our research and all of our programs that we run. So thank you everybody. I'm gonna finish up now and I'm gonna save my chat for those people who wanna have um, me to send out the slides and I'll send you out a PDF version of the slides. Um, and thank you for being on board. Take care.